Hi, I'm Chris Lee, and this is Virtually Speaking. Joining us today is Judy Carter, a legendary comedian turned keynote speaker who graced the Hollywood comedy club scene with all of the legends in the 70s and 80s, sharing the stage with the likes of Jay Leno and Jerry Seinfeld, to then headlining as a stand-up in Vegas and Atlantic City, and as an opening act for performers like Prince. Judy has performed on over 100 TV shows and is the author of six books, she even wrote the Bible, not a joke. She wrote the Simon and Schuster bestseller, the comedy Bible and the new comedy Bible released in 2020. Judy's proven methods are legendary among today's top performers. Alumni of her workshops include Seth Rogen, Hannah Gadsby, Sherry Shepard, among others. And as Lily Tomlin says, Judy Carter helps others find their authentic persona and communicate it in a way that makes audiences laugh. Interviewed by Oprah Winfrey on her show, she said, Judy Carter can show you how to make your sense of humor pay off. From a headlining stand-up comic to becoming an in-demand corporate speaker who coined the phrase motivational humorist, Judy hilariously performs and speaks as an expert on leadership and communication techniques, as well as purpose and stress reduction. She's been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, CNN, on Oprah, and as a frequent contributor to NPR's All Things Considered. So please join me now with the legendary Judy Carter. Well, hello, Judy Carter, and thank you for joining me here on Virtually Speaking. How are you doing? Oh, my goodness. It's like still pandemic, still in the house. I wish we could meet in person, but this is great to talk to you. Absolutely. Yeah, you're always fun in person and I love watching your videos of the performances that you give um, as a speaker, as a motivational humorist, which I think is a, a term you may have coined. Am I giving you too much credit? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I I'm gonna take all that credit. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take that credit, why not? Absolutely, and you know, your story is amazing. I, I The more and more I find out and learn about you, it just gets more exciting and interesting. Of course, um, you started out on the Sunset Strip as a comedian in the comedy store. Is that right? That's right. I started off as a comic and, and at this time, it was the comedy store, woman running it. Uh, I think you know her, Mitzi Shore. She passed yeah. away a few years ago. I know. But, you Holly know- Holly Shore's mom. Polly Shore's mom. I never thought I'd hear that. Okay, I'm just saying. <laughs> and, it, you know, she didn't even have a liquor license. It, and those were the days where she got, Jenny, you know, Mitzi talked like that. Yeah. Jenny, I need you to do a show tonight. Mitzi, I can't. I can't do it every day. But I don't have any comics. <laughs> And and back then, that's how long ago it was. There wow. there were now everybody and your gynecologist is a comic, right? right. Like, like here's your pap smear and come see me. I'm performing at yuck yucks, you know. But <laughs> back then, Chris, it was it there weren't many comics, not like now where people line up forever just to right. be able to. But who were your peers? Up. Who was performing with you in those days that you we're, we're friendly with? Well, you know, I, my buddies were Robin Williams, Jay uh, Leno, Elaine Boozler. Wow. Um, um, uh, certainly Jerry Seinfeld. Um, these were, these were, we all went through it together, you know. It was on that stage that really helped me become what I am now, which is a corporate speaker. Right. Is because we had to work all sorts of different audiences. And, you know, you and I are from California, and certainly when you do a corporate gig, um, what works in uh, New York or California might not work in Alabama or South Carolina. And it's interesting because those, we had so many different kinds of audience. Sometimes there'd be like a bus tour of a religious group, <laughs> all sorts of things. And it really taught me how, how do I work that audience in front of me? And I think that's so important when you have a corporate gig, they want to laugh. And as well as you know, you and I know, you can't say what you say in a comedy club no. at a corporate gig. Please, no, please. please no, no, 
<laughs> I had I had one comedian who did his he was very, very famous. He did his first ever corporate gig and he said the F word like many times. And the client was like, what the heck's going on here? And he wrote them an apology and he said, you know, I could have not said the F word at all in my in my uh, routine, but that's what I normally do. And his manager was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot to tell him what corporate <laughs> meant. <laughs> but, you know, the, the funny thing is, is that you, um, well, you're funny, period. Uh, but, you know, the great thing about you is as a motivational humorist, you really do customize better and more than than even regular speakers do. I mean, you really go yeah. into the trials and tribulations of your audiences and you ha help them laugh about it. Oh, it's so much fun. Credit. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Like I've been doing a lot of gigs in healthcare right now. Yeah. Um, and I just did one in, at Caesars for 1000 surgical technologists. And these and here's the thing about the people in the audience. Nobody, there's a difference between a, being lectured to and the speaker, right? Like sure. you've got to follow your dream. You got to do this. No, don't tell people what they got to do. What I do is I call up people in the audience and they, before the gig and I say, yeah. tell me what's a bad day. What's a bad day? And they'll give me all these insider information. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about it is I make my speech about them. So uh, like surgical technologists, I think what I said, I said, you know, did, were there signs in childhood that you were going to be a surgical technologist? Were you the one going, hey, Tommy, get off that slide. I haven't sterilized it yet. <laughs> you know, and, and then they, it's like, it hits a home run because it's about them right? It's about them. I, and then I do a whole thing about their acronyms. You, you know, yeah. Chris, people in corporate do not speak with full words. It's There's a lot of acronyms. A lot of acronyms. Yeah. And oh my goodness. So I like getting a list of everybody's acronyms. I like, you know, find here are the top 10 ways, you know, you're stressed. And then I'll do like, you stay in a bad marriage because you can't handle train, training anybody new. And, you know, and then they just, I yeah. mean, they just, they just, cr they crack up because it's, it's really about them. And that's how I found out how going from the stand up comedy stage, where you really basically talk about anything, to the corporate, where, you know, the audiences look at you and go, wait. Is it is that appropriate? Is HR laughing? If HR is right. laughing, I'll laugh. Is it okay? I don't want to lose my job. And so I, it's a little tricky, but I figured it out. Yeah, you really have. And there's other, so many other humorists who really owe it all to you in, in so many ways because they saw you or you paved the way for that type of speaker. Of course, um, you know, I, I want to go back just really quick to the comedy, uh, uh, you know, life that you really had as a comedian. What was the most? <laughs> I can't tell you all about. The I know, but I, well, I, there was one video that I uncovered on my own one day. This is like a couple of years ago. Uh oh. Uh oh. You were like opening for a band, or you were opening for something unbelievably a huge name in a big arena, and I just thought it was so cool. I know you must have done a lot of that, but tell us a little bit about a couple of the big gigs that you had as a well as a okay comedian. well yeah i traveled with you know prince uh you know <sighs> prince right and uh um you i was told prince? Uh, yeah i was in travel yeah you know and and that was hard um yeah they told me don't you know your his audience won't like you you know <laughs> you, you know you're gonna bomb and i went you know there's always a way to crack open any audience and so what I did was at the Roxy on Sunset, right? Uh, and so everybody's standing in line. It was just like a really, really ultra, like cool people. Right. And so I got out there while they're standing in line and I pretended to be a blind accordion player. So I played the same song on the accordion over and over again. And the line starts to move and they go, oh, thank God we don't have to listen to that. Oh, my God, that was 
terrible. <laughs> anyway, they all go in, they order their drinks, and they go, okay, we're going to see Prince. And everybody goes, yay! And opening the show is Judy Carter. And I came out with an accordion, <laughs> and the entire audience said, oh, shit! <laughs> and I had them in the palm of my hands. It was, it was like I, wow. I started my act before they came in, right. I knew, I knew there was something. So there's, there's always a way to get to any, you know, to get to any audience. Yeah, and then of course you wrote the book. You wrote the comedy. Oh Bible. yes, I've written books. I mean, <laughs> and Oprah Winfrey. Uh, you know, I don't know if anybody. Oh, else this is a is. good story, Chris. This she is had you on her story. show. This is so weird. Um, it was a time in my life where I was really down, like my mom had died and I, I just, I didn't want to do comedy anymore. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I just quit, right? I just quit. Uh, I quit in the middle of a tour. I just, uh, I don't know. It's, it's not an easy life for a girl being a comic. You know, always on the right. road, always by yourself, always getting heckled when you get on stage. So I went, I don't know what to do. I thought I'd get a job, but you know, I have no job skills. So I rented an office with an office share. I went there every day. People said, what do you do? I said, nothing. <laughs> they, they assumed I was in management, I guess. And, and, and so I just started typing for this girl and she said, you should write a book. And I, I wrote this book, how to do comedy. It was rejected by 59 agents. Wow. 59 and number 60, I just never gave up. Right. People said, nobody wants to know how to learn how to do comedy. It was really a book about how to turn your problems into punchlines and do comedy. And love it. And that book, um, next thing you know, Random House published it. And then next thing you know, I get a call from Oprah Winfrey's um, TV show. And they say, we'd like to have her on. We'd like to interview her. We didn't know you could teach people how to be funny. And I went on that show. And that's when I did my first corporate gig because I didn't know they existed. And they said, well, I think it was for the Fresh Produce Company or something. I don't know. I remember a dancing avocado next to me. Who knows? <laughs> but but, <laughs> but I, I went, wait, you know, I'm going to do my act. You want me to just talk about lightening up and humor techniques for you know, the office? And they go, yeah. And I went really? And I don't have to stay in a comedy condo and you're going to pay me what? And right. I just went, you know, this occupation isn't, you know, the occupation isn't there on career day in high school. No. And right. No. So I so just what did, got what did, this. Oprah, what did Oprah um, say to you? Like, was she, had she read the book and she was really excited about it and well, she was implementing some of your teachings? Uh, I don't think Oprah needs to implement any of my teachings. I think she's doing just fine on her own. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> she said, um, you know, my guest, Judy Carter, wrote this book. She held up the book right there next wow. to her face. She said, you know, Judy can make anyone funny. And, wow. you know, here she is. And uh, anything held next to Oprah becomes successful. And next thing you know, you know, I start with everybody wanted to study with me and my students have now all really gone on a huge successful career. Seth Rogen started my class. Wow. Hannah Gatsby, I did a tour of Australia because my book has come out in Australia. She studied, you know, she, she just won two Emmys for uh, her Netflix specials. Wow. And Sherry Shepard, Maz Giovanni, the list goes on and on of the people who have taken the class and now awesome. it's just been amazing. I wrote this new book and the emails are, it, it, I, I think the, I like to look at the positive side of things. And right. during this pandemic, I've connected with so many people from other countries. And I don't think I would have had that opportunity. And right now comedy is becoming huge. Like in the, my book ushered in the boom, the comedy boom of the eighties. Um, where everything turned to comedy clubs and everybody was opening a comedy club. Everyone wants to be a comic. Housewives want to be comics. Dentists, you know, <laughs> you're funny dentist, right? Yeah. And now that boom is happening in places like 
I, I sold the rights to Mongolia, Taiwan, uh, we Russia. We need humor in life. We Absolutely. need to laugh at this time more than ever, right? And it's interesting to me and, and beautiful is that no matter what country anybody lives in, humor is something that connects us all. Mm -hmm. And American humor um, is a bit different from, let's say, China, the humor in China. Right. They don't necessarily find uh, shame funny. Like, mm -hmm. you know, American humor is, oh, you know, I can't seem to lose weight. And um, people aren't re used to revealing, like, they're more like, tell a joke, like a joke. Right. But what I show people is that, you know, you, you have a choice in life. You can get stressed out and drink. Or you can laugh and drink. And that and that's what I teach in the corporate. I go like, yeah. you know, um, you're you you're not a miserable marriage. It's it's comedy material, you know. <laughs> I mean, you right. don't have the boss from hell. It's a heckler, and here's how you handle that. And so right. it's interesting to me that, you know, when I do corporate, I you know, I'm not going to tell people quit your job and become a comic. That's not what I'm there for. But I find that they really appreciate that information that, mm -hmm. you know, when you laugh at a problem, you have some power over it. it yeah, I mean, you, you have a choice, you know, and I love your line. You said, um, uh, my kid didn't get uh, arrested on cops. He's just, uh, he's, he's, an inter he's in entertainment. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think the setup to that was uh, <laughs> there's nothing you can't turn into comedy. My son wasn't arrested drunk on the TV show Cops. I have a relative in show business. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I just, I mean, obviously, you know, someone said comedy is tragedy plus time. I mean, certainly it's like, you know, we there comes a point when you maybe need to move on from the pain and find a target for your humor. And I, you know, cause I, I think humor gets people in trouble, um, sure. making fun of other people, other sure. races, you know, all of that stuff is, it's, it's a tough time with comedy now with, you know, the oh, all the PR, correctness. all the pub, all the, uh, uh, politically correct, uh, the movement with that. But, you know, you've done, I was just thinking, you've done literally probably more gigs than almost anybody I know. You've, you've done <laughs> thousands of speaking engagements. I know that to be fact. Um, you've been uh, featured by the Wall Street Journal and New York Times and CNN and everybody with your books. But I'm, I'm curious, um, what is the feedback that you have gotten from the corporate world? Like, what is it that they say afterwards that really touched you? that you didn't think you were going to hear or that you weren't expecting? I'm That's a really good that. question. That really is. Um, well, I'm certainly appreciative when they go, boy, do we have a problem? How, who are we going to get next year? And I say, yeah. well, call Chris Lee. Find, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it'll be hard, but he'll find someone. I'll find someone. <laughs> yeah, I think um, when I first started doing this, there weren't a lot of women doing it. <clears throat> um, and, you know, they said, oh, my goodness, we're so tired of having football players. So it's really great to have you there. Right. So there was that. But, you know, the one thing hard for a comic is, I think, doing something not funny. And so I started to tell some personal stories that weren't that funny for my life, like mm -hmm. closing with it. Mm hmm sometimes like the effect that I've had on somebody and, you know, or talking about growing up with my disabled sister and, um, and I would tell a story and I could, and I wasn't getting laughs, but I could feel the audience. I could feel something else. Like I felt from the audience, I would mm. feel this, that they they were moved that right. it was, they were so moved. And afterwards, a lot of times I'll have a, a book signing. And I noticed that when I just told jokes without a poignant story, they go, I, we loved you. You were great. Right. But they go, you really touched me. 
Right. And they wanted to share their life. You know, they wanted to talk about things from their life. And I went, okay, I'm doing something right. I'm, I'm getting past entertainment into truly right. um, Solving moving problems. people. Yeah. Helping people. Yeah, just touching, touching a different kind yeah. of way. And then I noticed, which obviously not good during COVID, but they all wanted to hug me. They wanted, <laughs> like before they go, you were great, you know, slap my shoulders thing. But they really wanted to mm. have a connection with me because I connected with them. And, and that's when I wrote this book called The Message of You. Mm. And I wrote it because I feel that we all have a really strong message in our life, like an essential message. And I've been working with a lot of speakers to help them find it. And I, and I tell, and I did a TED talk on it. It's like, um, I, that was the one you helped me get, which was really um, a big deal for me because it helped me really solidify what I'm talking about. And right. the word message, it came to me and I said, you can't spell message without a mess. Wow. M-E-S-S, -S, the first four letters of the word message. And you can't see that mess without age. So mess, age, and you have your message. And um, wow. I, yeah. And I really discovered that I think, I think our process in life is to all of us is to be more of who we are, you know, truly who we are, like authentic self. And that's been my goal in life. And that seems to be what I'm headed towards now when I speak to people. And I feel when I'm more myself, people that are more themselves. And it's, and it's, a, it's become an honor to have this job, you know? Yeah. Just, just a spectacular that sounds like That sounds like leadership. I mean, that's a, these are great uh, uh, points and lessons for leaders, you know, obviously. And for anybody who's working with other people in, on a team whether virtually or in person. So that those are, yeah, those are strong. <laughs> that's a strong message. <laughs> I never thought of that. I haven't done a lot of leadership. Yeah, I think things. I'm going to think more of you in leadership as well, because these are great traits for leaders and great lessons for leaders. And leadership's obviously a word that I hear a lot. Um, my clients are looking for speakers who can uh, talk about leadership and who are experts on it. And you certainly I do are. think humor is is a humor and um, personal stories yeah are a great way to inspire storytelling is the other thing oh yeah storytelling is um, is very strong um, very strong and of course storytelling with humor is good and then ending with a really strong message I mean you don't I, I don't know. It's just, it's just been, like I say, so great to go to places I'd never go, you know, like I have a gig in Des Moines. No one ever goes, gee, I want to go on a vacation. Let's go to Des Moines. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like nobody ever, I, let's, oh my God, I got a couple weeks off. Let's hit Nebraska or Great Forks, North Dakota. Or Medora. You know Dakota. when you're there that the people are going to be unbelievable. The people are going to be so great. Well, it's it's those places have become such such a great experience of meeting people. And you know, I Chris, I really feel right now that you know there's such a divide between people, and you know, political divides and cultural divides. And, right everybody seems so angry right now sure and i i really think when we share a story or a laugh with somebody it really profoundly connects, connects us to them don't you think like well absolutely i think that that's why comedians and comedy and and fun and funniness and laughing and humor are so important to the planners and the events right now because they they know that that no matter who you're sitting next to you know, even music can create, oh, I don't like that kind of music. Oh no, country's not for me. r and is not for me. Rock's not for me. I'm more of this kind of guy or yeah. gal. But with humor, really this one funny thing in the room can just easily make everybody connect and say, oh, that was God, I love that. Because we're all living the same life, even though we try and 
divide ourselves. We are all living the life of a human being. So, so what was it that you that made you write the new comedy Bible? Did you talk about some of this in there? Or oh yeah. Um, well, you know, I have to tell you, just my luck. Um, the comedy Bible came out the day. Uh, uh, let's see, September 12, two thousand and one. Oh. And that's when I launched a comedy tour. Your book came after, out, wow i didn't i thought your book no, came out even before that but that's that's a, no not that was another one but that was like 9 11. right um and and that was kind of like i am launching a comedy tour after one of america's largest tragedies yeah and how the hell am i gonna pull that off right Right. And I started my show. I remember, you know, September 12th. <laughs> there we all are. And I just went, let's let's have a moment. You know, I started with a moment and then I go, well, these tariffs can take away those buildings. They take away lives. I'll be damned if they're going to take away my sense of humor. And then everybody applauded. And then we started to ease into it and then boom. And we had we had a really good time. So, you know, it's 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 something that I think is no longer levity is something that's no longer just like happens. It seems like we really do have to make a bit of an effort now. Yeah. <laughs> that and a little drink and okay. Yeah. So the new book, the new comedy bible, what was the reason behind that? And Kind of well, my old book um, um, had things in it like uh, Bill Cosby is ah. such a wonderful legend and Louis C.K. is someone to emulate. <laughs> and I went, you know what? It's I got to update this. A new book. Right. Uh, it's not even just an update. I totally rewrote it. And I'm really glad I did. Mm. And I wrote it um, in mind with an international audience. And right. now it's like being released in 12 different languages. So Amazing. I'm really excited about that. So is that book also for people who are not aspiring comedians to read? Uh, what would they get out of it? Well, let's just face it. We all think our life is a joke, don't we? Sometimes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, you know, I think there's something, it's basically what, what it is. It's just, you know, comedy is a bunch of formulas. Everybody wants to be funny. Everybody, I, 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 when my first book came out, NPR, National Public Radio, set a challenge. You say you can make anyone funny. And we're going to find the most unfunny person in America and see if we can make him funny. And he was a captain uh, in, at a naval base, Port Wainimi. Uh -huh. And this guy, he, he just cleared a room anytime he opened. He was so boring. He, would, he made, you know, Mr. Spock on Star Trek look really exciting. <laughs> he was just awful. He just he talked, you wanted to poke your eyes out the pen. And he had to lecture people, you know, the new cadets, and they were all like sleeping. So I accepted their challenge and I made him funny. And the way I did it is that comedy is always the truth. What is the truth about you? <laughs> and so I had him go, I know I'm boring. And everybody kind of perked up and right. they laughed. I mean, this is my idea of getting wild. And he loosened his tie a little bit <laughs> and then go, oh, is that too much? So this notion of a little lighthearted self-mocking, again, is a real leadership trait. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of women in leadership don't understand, you know, they want to be respected, you right. know, but they don't get that making fun of yourself um, um, says you have confidence. Yeah. You know, you need confidence to make fun of yourself. And that's like, you know, everybody who has succeeded, is, wins elections, you know, they're, they, they're able to poke fun at themselves. And so the book has a lot of exercises in it that's like that. Like, wow. here's how you do that. You want to do a speech and you don't want to put people to sleep. Here's what's called the list of three. You know, this is a list of three exercise. Like, you know, I, I should have known my marriage was over. There are three subtle clues, you know, the three subtle clues when you're, you know, your, your marriage is over. You're not kissing as much, you know, you're not eating dinner together. 
he's moved in with his new wife. <laughs> uh, you know, so the third one is a, is a ex- obvious. So the, it's, a, it's a formula, though. Right. So isn't it great to be able to learn a few formulas so you can start getting laughs when you talk to people, when you're Absolutely. at a meeting? Absolutely. Um, you know, to get heard. So I do think, you know, we, it's something that you can learn. You can learn some basic comedy formulas. Now, if you want a career as a stand up comic, you've got to have a lot of talent. But if you have no talent, I can make you funny for five minutes. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. you don't need Makes to sense. be like, boom, boom, boom. I'm killing it. I'm rocking it. No, you're at a corporate meeting. You don't need to. You know? All right. Yeah. So, so that's what I think. I think it's, it's good for people who want to mm, have a couple little tricks up their sleeve. I love that. And it definitely, again, is a leadership uh type book, you know, that leaders should, you know, read because this is something that that's only going to help them be better leaders and, and uh, own the room better and create, uh, you know, I like uh, that own the room, you know, it's, you know, Chris, it's really interesting, because I've always been more of a um, stress reduction speaker, you know, um, you know, life balance kind of speaker, humor speaker. But now I'm going like, Oh, my God, I'm gonna be a leadership speaker. I think so. Well, here's the thing. It's interesting. Like, I think everything I've learned about being a stand-up comic could help any CEO. It's like when I walk on stage, right? And I've got kind of a hostile audience with comedy club. I have to know how to grab the mic and bam, get people's attention. That's good. Turn turn them. You know, and that's the other thing is like, if you're walking up there, they've never seen you before. You don't look like them. You're too young. You're too old. Whatever preconceived notion they have. You've got to overcome a lot in that uh, in that role or in that room. So yeah, and yeah. read the room. You got, you got to know how to room. read a room. I talk to speakers about that all the time. You know, how can I give something to this audience that nobody else can, or what can I give them that nobody else can? So um, yeah, that's is- interesting. And yeah, and handling hecklers. I mean, that's kind of I love that conflict. Part. Yeah. Yeah. So a moment ago, you said uh, boom, boom, boom. I thought of Rodney Dangerfield. I just yeah. want to ask you, who who are your favorite comedians that you ever have seen uh, in person or not in person these days and all the way back? Like, who are your favorite? I just well, I grew to- up, you know, watching Lucille Ball, and you know, I just yeah, every girl, you know, my age grew up just like, oh, that's so funny. She's so funny. And then I remember seeing Joan Rivers on Carson and going like. I see, I didn't realize then that comics spend so much time scrutinizing this word or that word. How do I do that joke? And I just thought, oh, she's just up there. It just comes out of her mouth all funny, you know? <laughs> and Joan Rivers was, um, we lost her way too soon. She was, she was so funny. Yeah. Now I love, um, I love uh, the people who are really good writers. I love Chris Rock. I love uh, Mike Babiglia. He's just amazing. Um, Jeff Jeffries is so funny. Of course, Hannah Gatsby, my students, Ross <laughs> Gilbrani, Sherry Shepard. There's yeah. so many, there's so many incredible comics out there. Yeah. Ali Wong is wonderful. Um, it's just so much so much talent out there it's yeah. it's really an exciting time and i can't wait to uh COVID ends and we could take off our masks and start enjoying each other without fear absolutely i am so looking forward to getting back out there and seeing comedians again and music again i'm sure that it'll happen before we know it and, yes uh, and hug again and i'm so excited to go out and uh do a gig yeah. and be able to have a book signing yeah. and not just touch people emotionally, but give a couple hugs as well yeah. and not be scared. I'm going to die. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm looking forward to seeing, reading the new book and seeing you in person again soon. Take care.